Good evening, folks. Welcome to 24th session on the book of Acts. I'd like to begin this evening with a reading of Psalm 68. Psalm 68. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered, and let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As me wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them exult before God. Yes, let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord and exults before him. A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O oh God, when you went before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You shed abroad a plentiful rain, O oh God. You confirmed your inheritance when it was parched. Your creatures settled in it. You provided in your goodness for the poor, O oh God. The Lord gives the command. The women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she who remains at home will divide the spoil. When you lie down among the sheepfolds, you are like the wings of a dove covered with silver and its pinions with glistening gold. When the Almighty scattered the kings there, it was snowing in Zalman, a mountain of God. In the, is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O mountains with many peaks, at the mountain which God has desired for his abode? Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them, as at Sinai in holiness. You have ascended on high. You have led captive your captives. You have received gifts from among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord may God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. God is to us a God of deliverances, and to God the Lord belongs, belong escapes from death. Surely God will shatter the head of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who goes on in his guilty deeds. The Lord says, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that your foot may shatter them in blood. The tongue of your dogs may have its portion from your enemies. They have seen your procession, O God, the procession of God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers went on, the musicians after them, in the midst of the maidens beating tambourines. Bless God in the congregations, even the Lord, you who are of the fountain of Israel. There is Benjamin, the youngest, ruling them, the princes of Judah in their throng, the princes of Zebulon and the princes of Naphtali. Your God has commanded your strength. Show yourself strong, O God, who have, who have acted on our behalf. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring gifts to you. Rebuke the beasts in the reeds, the herd of bulls with the calves of the people. Trample underfoot the pieces of silver. He has scattered the peoples who delight in war. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times. Behold, he speaks with his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe strength to the Lord. His majesty over is over Israel, and his strength is in the skies. O God, you are awesome from your sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. Blessed be God. I read that for verse 31, which mentions Ethiopia, and we are looking this evening at Philip and his encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. One of the commentators I've been uh, reading from is Ben Worthington, Witherington, not Worthington, Ben Witherington, who wrote what he calls a social 
uh, rhetorical uh, commentary on the book of Acts, sort of giving it Acts in, in uh, story form, but setting it very uh, soundly in its original context in the uh, time and to the demographic to which it was written. But he entitled this section, Philip and the Unique Eunuch, which I thought was kind of clever. And I wondered how long it took him to think that up and uh, and get it published. But I want to remind you that there will be no class next Monday, which is Christmas Day, nor the Monday after that, which is New Year's Day. Uh, we will resume uh, our study on Monday, January 8th of 2024, following this class, and that will be a recap. It'll be the 25th session that we do on X. So it's, and since we're going to hit uh, the end of a chapter tonight, uh, Acts chapter 8, I thought it would be a good point at which we can uh, recap what happened in Jerusalem and the initial spread from Jerusalem before we look at the conversion of Saul and uh, pick up the, the study of Acts going forward later on in January. But I want to read for you first before we dive into this text. This may end up being a shorter class as I have fewer pages of notes, but I also have more stuff stuck up here in my head that I probably want to get out. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26, back to the English Standard Version. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of, e of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is a very interesting story. We had an earlier account of Philip with in Samaria, and he had a fair amount of success there, uh, preaching the gospel to the Samaritans, and they believed, including Simon, who had formerly practiced magic. And we read a little bit about that and uh, talked about Simon's sincerity a little bit uh, in, briefly uh, when we were uh, last together last week. But this is this is an interesting encounter that Philip has here, because there are a lot of difficulties and peculiar things that we encounter in this text. First, we have in verse 26, the angel of the Lord uh, says to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. The angel doesn't say that. Luke is inserting that parenthetically as, a, as an explanation. Philip is having success in Samaria. There is a door open for the gospel there. The people have seen seen the signs and wonders that he's doing. They're listening to the message. They're paying attention to him, and they're being baptized. The gospel is spreading there. 
why go from this fertile ground, this, this fertile place, to the middle of the desert? Now, the road that goes south from Jerusalem to Gaza, Gaza was formerly one of the cities of the Philistines. Uh, it had been destroyed. It was rebuilt. We'll, we'll touch on that briefly in just a moment. But it was built about 12 miles inland from the uh, shore of the Mediterranean when it was rebuilt. But that road is essentially the middle of nowhere. There's no villages. There's no population. It's just a caravan route. It is one of the least likely places you would expect to have an evangelistic encounter. And yet the Spirit tells Philip, or the, the, the Spirit tells Philip to the angel, go, go down there, go, down, go, to this, go to this caravan route, go follow the road south toward uh, Gaza from Jerusalem. And he goes. This is, like I said, Gaza, it was formerly a city of the Philistines. It was destroyed during the reign of the Maccabean kings um, sometime between 100 and 96 BC, uh, destroyed uh, by Alexander Janaeus, and Josephus uh, records that. It was rebuilt by the Roman governor of Syria in 57 BC, uh, Gabinius. And it was it, it had become a city once more uh, by the time that this account is taking place. But the road where Philip goes, uh, I'm trying to get a point across to you, the point that the this is not a place full of people. It, it's a place where Philip encounters um, the eunuch and whoever's driving his chariot for him, because we will learn as we go on through this text that this eunuch is a fairly important official. He is not traveling alone, even though the text doesn't tell us that there were other people with him. There were other people with him. Uh, the queen of Ethiopia is not going to send a trusted servant, no matter how trusted, um, and when he's this high ranking, off on his own. But it's interesting. Rise and go. Acts has some odd commandments in it. Uh, we have the command of the angel in chapter 5, verse 20, to the apostles as they are being released from prison. The angel says, go, stand in the temple, and speak all the words of this life that has been given to you. The temple is where they were just arrested, not 24 hours previous. Uh, it's been less than 24 hours since they were arrested. And now God is saying, get back out there and, and go back there to the place where you were arrested. Keep on preaching. That seems a strange commandment when you uh, look at it from the human point of view. Um, Peter is told in Acts chapter 10, verses 13 to 20, rise and go with the servants that Cornelius sent. And Peter had to be wondering, go with the Gentiles? Are you really sure of this? Um, there is another commandment that is given in Acts chapter 9, and uh, verses 10 and 11, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord, and the Lord said to him, rise, and go. You see a theme here? Rise and go to the street that is called straight to the house of Judas and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And God is sending Ananias to Saul to teach him the gospel and baptize him. And Ananias has a problem with that. And we'll talk about that when we get to Ananias. In Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, the Spirit has compelled Paul to go to Jerusalem. And Paul says, it's been hidden from me what's going to happen to me. Everybody else seems to know, Paul, when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested. Don't go to Jerusalem. People keep urging him, don't go to Jerusalem. Sometimes the Spirit will direct us in ways that don't seem to make sense. And 
I think we don't always understand the mind of God. Talk about statements of the obvious. <laughs> we rarely understand the mind of God and, and what his plans are for our life uh, and how he is planning to use us and how we can be effective in his kingdom. Because he may send us into places where we think, are you sure about this, Lord? Is this really where you want me at this time? Is this really where I need to, where I need to be? And, and, I, and you take the lesson from that, that teach where you are. Let your light shine where you are, not where you think you ought to be. Perhaps where you think you ought to be is where you ought to be, but let your light shine where you find yourself. So we're told about this man, that Philip rises, he goes down there, he rose and he went, and there was an Ethiopian. The Ethi Ethiopia, modern Nubia, um, about 200 miles south of modern uh, Egypt, this is a journey for this eunuch that probably took him about a month to get from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. And it's likely that he didn't spend just a few days there worshiping. We're told that he, he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He was probably there for, let's say, a month. And then another month home. So that's three months out of the year that he's away from his position in Ethiopia, which is a very important uh, position. And there are people who say that this is really the first account of the of the gospel going to the Gentiles. The text doesn't tell us that he is a Gentile. It's possible that he is a Jew who is part of the dispersion of the Jews that is that has taken place. He may have found himself down in Ethiopia and taken service with the queen there, it's possible that he is a Gentile. But he's also a Gentile from a very, very far away place. The borders of the Roman Empire do not include Ethiopia. Ethiopia is beyond the reach of Rome. And there are writings, there are Roman writings that speak of lands beyond Egypt as being the ends of the earth. Do you remember what Jesus told his disciples or the apostles in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here we have the gospel. It's going to go to the ends of the earth because the eunuch is going to take it with him. And after he's baptized, he goes on his way rejoicing. And he's carrying the gospel message with him beyond the borders of the reach of Rome. I think that's one reason that Luke includes this account, is showing that this is the fulfillment of the command that Jesus gave to his apostles. Witness to the ends of the earth. Well, here goes a witness to the ends of the earth, uh, as it was known at that time. But I don't think that's the, the main reason that it's being included here, and I don't think it's because he's a Gentile. I think, rather, it's the fact that uh, he's called out here um, as a eunuch, a court official uh, of Candace, the queen of Ethi Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. The Greek word uh, for eunuch can be translated official, as an official. Uh, it was mentioned while we were in Rome uh, yesterday that somebody had thought that a eunuch was simply an official, and it can be used that way. In fact, frequently in the Greek Old Testament, you find uh, the, the Greek word eunuchos translated as official. Uh, it is used in Genesis 39, verse 1 of Potiphar who was an officer for uh, Pharaoh. But when that when the Hebrew word, whatever the Hebrew word is there is translated into Greek, they use the, the Greek word eunuchos. Uh, it's used of, 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 um, of the chief uh, 
cupbearer and the chief baker in Genesis 40, verse 2. It's used a few other places in the Old Testament. So it's very likely that, um, or it's it, it's possible. Let me let me retract the statement. Very likely, it's possible that it's being used in this way, but I don't think it is, because he is in service to the queen. A male serving the females of the royal household is generally an emasculated male. And the practice of castration or, or emasculation in the ancient Near East and in ancient times was fairly widespread. Uh, it could, pardon my graphic, graphicness here, it could simply be a matter of the removal of the testicles. Often, it included the removal of the testicles and the male organ as well, some or all of it, uh, which is why, according to Jewish law, a full eunuch could not be a proselyte because he can't be circumcised. There's nothing left to circumcise. And so it's, you look at the, at the position of this eunuch and you and and you come away scratching your head, asking, "Well, what um, what is his standing?" We're told that he's going up to Jerusalem to worship. He can't enter into the assembly. If you look in the Book of Deuteronomy, uh, did I write it down? I'm pretty sure I did. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1. It says that no one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. And the Jews took that fairly seriously. If you were a eunuch, you could not enter into the assembly of the Lord. So if this man is a eunuch, physically, as I as I believe he would be, because he's serving in the in the in the court of of the queen, and you'll find examples of eunuchs in especially in the book of Esther, Esther chapter one, verses 10, 12, 15, chapter two, verses three. 14 and 15, 21, 23, and, and so on. The man who was in charge of the harem for the king is a eunuch. He's physically a eunuch because that means he cannot violate the women who belong to the king. Don't throw eggs at me. It's it's not me being the, the, me making that rule that the women were uh, the, the property of the king. That's simply the way it was. If you were in the in the king's harem, you were his property, and you belonged to him only, and no other man could have you except for the king. And so they don't have women guarding women, they have men guarding women, and if the men are guarding the women, they make sure that those men cannot also molest the women or have their way with them. And so here we have this man, this, this Ethiopian eunuch who is traveling down to Jerusalem to worship. It is possible that he is what is known as a proselyte of the gate. A proselyte of the gate was a Gentile who for one reason or another was not circumcised. He also did not have to keep the entirety of the law. He keeps us a, a condensed portion of the law that is very similar to what we're going to read later in Acts, in Acts chapter 15, when the church is meeting in Jerusalem, pondering what do we do with the Gentiles who are coming into the, into the church? And some are saying, we need to make them obey the law of Moses. And uh, James, the brother of Jesus, says, no, that's ridiculous. We can't, 
we weren't able to keep the law. Why would we bind that on the Gentiles? So instead they bind a lesser degree. Stay away from idols uh, and don't, uh, don't eat blood. Don't, don't consume blood. And those laws were bound on those who were proselytes of the gate so that they could come to Jerusalem, as this man is doing, coming to Jerusalem to worship. But he does not, he, he can't enter into the innermost courts of the temple. He can enter into the court of the Gentiles, even though he's maybe a smidge above a Gentile in, in the Jewish understanding. So we have Luke including this account of a man who is excluded by the law of Moses and by the traditions of the Jews, excluded from the assembly of worship. So why is this story here? He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah. We're going to go past where the eunuch is. We'll get back to uh, what he is reading from. But turn to Isaiah chapter 56. And listen to the promise of God. Isaiah 56, 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness. I have written in this in the margin of my Bible, which means it's not inspired, but it is official. Uh, Micah chapter six, verse eight is a cross reference there. Keep justice and do righteousness for soon. My salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Do you remember what Jesus said when he was driving out the uh, the the money changers from the temple. It is written that my house should be called a house of prayer, that you've made it a den of robbers, which is from uh, Jeremiah. But here in this text, God is speaking directly to the eunuchs. The one who is saying, behold, I am a dry tree, meaning I am the end of, of, the, uh, of the genealogical tree. Uh, I'm not going to father any children because I can't. Nor can I enter into the assembly because the law pro prohibits it. God says of him, I will give within the walls of my house a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. In other words, I'm opening up the door. Come on in. And when is that going to happen? Acts chapter 8. That's when we see it happening. This is prophecy being fulfilled. And Luke, I believe, is showing us this account of a formerly um, excluded portion of the population. Granted, it's a small portion of the population. There aren't a whole lot of eunuchs running around. <clears throat> but these formerly excluded people are now included. God says the gospel goes even to these people even to these who were formerly excluded from uh, from my worship. So we're told that he's an Ethiopian. Um, whether he's a former Jew or not, who knows? I don't think he is. I think he is um, 
a black man coming up from Ethiopia who is a God fearer of some sort, probably at some time in the in his past has been uh, become a proselyte uh, in so far as as he is able. He's a man of some importance because Luke tells us that he is. Uh, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Candace is not the name of the queen. Candace is the title. The Candace is the queen mother. The queen mother rules in place of her son because her son is thought to be a child of the sun, you know, the big bright shiny thing up in the sky a child of the son and this woman, and is therefore too holy to concern himself with matters of state. He is instead a priest king, interceding on behalf of, of the son, and spends his time in devotion and worship. And so his mother rules in his place. His mother's an extremely important individual. She takes care of the matters of the state, and we're told that this man, the eunuch, is in charge of the entirety of her treasury. She's the queen of the entire country. She probably has a fair amount of resources at her command, and they have been entrusted to this man. You don't just grab somebody off the street and say, here, you're in charge of my bank account. Here's my bank routing number and my checkbook and my so the last four digits of my social security number. You want to make sure that you really trust the individual that you put over your finances, or if you give them power of attorney over your over your money, or you you say here I'm going to put you on my checking or on my banking accounts and and on my on my other financial accounts. So this guy is he is very very high up in importance. <clears throat> We're told that he had come up to Jerusalem to worship. Um, so he is devout at any rate, because as I said earlier, it's about a month's journey. Now, the chariot that he's traveling in is not a war chariot. It's not a racing chariot. It's a, probably a large uh, four-wheeled cart that's being pulled by a team of donkeys. Uh, and it's being driven by somebody other than the, the eunuch because he's sitting there probably on a bench reading from the scroll of Isaiah. He's reading out loud because Philip hears him reading, and that's the way people read. Uh, the, in these times, they would read out loud, and they're not reading to themselves like we do. But he's reading uh, from the scroll of Isaiah. That's also another funny thing. A scroll of the book of Isaiah would be extremely difficult for a Gentile to obtain, especially someone who is excluded from the assembly. It's not like today where you can just walk into any bookstore and pick up a Bible or, you know, go to Amazon.com and buy 16 different Bibles and have them all delivered to your house with two-day shipping with Prime or next-day shipping. They'll sell a Bible to anybody now. But first off, these scrolls are produced by hand by the scribes, and the scribes are very particular about who they will uh, distribute them to. The, the temple has the lion's share of the scribes. Synagogues get, uh, if they're lucky, synagogues can, will have a scroll. You remember in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus went to Nazareth and he preached the, his first uh, gospel sermon. He goes to Luke. Uh, he goes to Luke. He goes to Nazareth in Luke 4 and they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. And he opens it up to Isaiah chapter 62 and reads from there only. It didn't say chapter 62 and have the verse numbers on it. He simply knew where he was going. So it makes me wonder if this Ethiopian, because he is such an important official, is granted some sort of diplomatic uh, favor um, by the Jews because they might want to have trade relations with Ethiopia, it being a fairly rich country. 
And as part of that, he was able to negotiate and, and obtain a, a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, if he simply purchased it outright. Um, it's a puzzling thing. I might like to ask him someday uh, up in heaven, just how, how did you get your hands on that? I probably won't care by then when I'm in heaven because I'll be too overawed by the presence of God. But it's a puzzling thing. He has a scroll of Isaiah. Don't know how he got it. Uh, Luke doesn't bother to tell us. So he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit tells Philip, go over and, and join the chariot. And Philip runs over. And then obviously, the chariot's not moving really fast, or the spirit has empowered uh, Philip to be, a, be a, a sprinter. And to be able to talk while he is running, uh, carry on a conversation. Uh, it, those of you who can still run, try that sometime. Run and try and talk at the same time. It's not easy. So he runs along, he overhears the man reading, and he speaks to him and says, do you understand what you're reading? The, the eunuch says, no, I can't unless somebody um, can, can guide me in this. And he invites him up into the chariot. Here it is here, and this 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 bit of acts is filled with remarkable coincidences. Uh, Kawinky dink, as Peter would want to say, uh, it, it's filled with just a, a bunch of remarkable coincidences. Philip just happens to be there as the guy is reading, and 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 the guy is puzzled by what he's reading, and here's this convenient Jew who understands scripture. You're the exactly the guy I need to tell me what this means. And so he invites him up into the chariot. And he asks him the question from this passage, and we're going to go to Isaiah in just a second. Who is this scripture talking about? So let's turn to Isaiah 52. You thought I was going to say Isaiah 53, didn't you? Isaiah 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. One of the four servant songs of the book of Isaiah. It's the last of the servant songs. And it is probably the most messianic passage in the entire book of Isaiah. What a coincidence that the eunuch happens to be reading this passage here that so clearly is speaking about Jesus from our perspective, because hindsight, we, we understand scripture backwards and, and we can see the application. He couldn't see the application as, as he was reading it. Isaiah 52, beginning in verse 13, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of them, because of him. For that which had not been told them, they see. And that which they had not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of ma or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that it, before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. 
he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall, be, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he's poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes transgression for the transgressors. I mean, what a perfect passage for Philip to start with. And that's exactly what he does. As the eunuch asks the question, is the prophet talking about himself? Is he the one who's borne the transgressions of many? Or is this somebody else? And then verse 35 says, Philip, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And there's another lesson. And I, I know you've heard this before. Start where people are. He's asking a question about this passage. Philip did not say, put your finger there and roll that scroll back to the book of Genesis. And let's start there. Or here, let me whip out my copy of the Gospel of Matthew, which hasn't been written yet. He starts there, and from that point, tells him the story of Jesus. And it's, it, it's an amazing thing. In Isaiah, there are four songs called the servant songs. Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. And what we just read, Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, 12. Those are the four servant songs. There, Isaiah uses the word servant frequently, and sometimes the servant is Israel. Uh, there is one time where the servant is um, Cyrus, the king of Persia, who hasn't been born yet when Isaiah is written, because he's going to be a deliverer. deliverer. But these four songs speak of a special servant, a servant who is coming to deliver Israel on a, on a higher level, not simply deliver them from Babylon, not simply deliver them from captivity and, and political oppression but deliver them from transgression, deliver them from the burden of their sin. And so we know when we're reading through this, that this is referring to Jesus. These are talking about Jesus. These are messianic prophecies. And Philip uses this passage. He may even have read ahead to chapter 56 that we read that talks about the eunuchs being welcomed in, though how Philip would know the man is a eunuch uh, because eunuchs don't wear you know, name badges saying, hi, my name is, I'm a eunuch. He may have read ahead being guided by the spirit. Whatever it is that Philip teaches the man, we're told in verse 36, here's another coincidence. As they're going along, here's some water. Here's a pool of water out in this desert place. And the eunuch says, hey, look, water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? And so they go down into the water. Philip baptizes him. And hey, time out. Wait a minute. What about verse 37? Look at your Bible. You have verse 36. As soon as, as they were going along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? The next verse is verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. What about verse 37? Probably you have a footnote or something in the margin of your Bible. Uh, mine says, some manuscripts add all or most of verse 37. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Almost everybody uh, who has studied scripture believes that that is an addition by a zealous scribe. It's not written in the same style uh, that Luke writes, and it may have been a scribal correction to make sure that there was a confession 
because you have to confess before you can be baptized. We can't have any of this baptizing without confessing. Don't get things backwards. Obviously, Luke doesn't give us the entire account of everything that, that Philip says. We're simply told that starting from this scripture, he told them the story about Jesus, which probably included repentance and baptism as part of the message. God provides a pool of water. You, you have to see the hand of God directing the course of these events. Uh, because here is this, this eunuch who has been in Jerusalem to worship, and he is heading away to a very distant land where the gospel will not go for a long time unless somebody can take it there now. Here's a convenient messenger. And God knows this man has an open heart. Does God know who his people are? Absolutely, he does. And if one of his people is off in a far distant country, is God going to make sure he hears the, hears the message and has a chance to obey? Absolutely, he is. You remember the thing about the sheep, the 99 sheep, and the one that's off someplace else? He goes off in search of that one leaving the 99 behind. And I understand that's not really a good application of, of this passage here. They go down into the water, Philip baptizes him, and then another miracle uh, happens. We're told that after they come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Philip disappears. And the eunuch doesn't panic. He doesn't say, where'd the guy go? He gets in his chariot and goes on his way rejoicing. The impact of the gospel message. It's called good news. He goes on his way excited. He's rejoicing. He has found a savior. And you can bet he took this message and told everybody in Ethiopia when he got there, including the queen, Anderson, even though they they worship they worship the sun down there, could have been dangerous for him. We're we're not told what became of him, but he went on his way rejoicing. He's excited. He's happy. He's overjoyed. Philip, though, in verse forty, found himself at Azotus. Azotus is uh, twenty miles further up the coast from Gaza. So it's a, it's a fair distance from where he was. How did he get there? The spirit carried him off. I don't know how that happens. First uh, Kings chapter 18, verse 12. Uh, there's been a famine for three years in the land, in the Northern kingdom of Israel. And Ahab has been searching and searching and searching for Elijah, the prophet, because Elijah said, had told him a chapter, uh, a few chapters earlier that it's not going to rain again, unless I say it's going to rain again. And then he disappears. Elijah's on his way back to um, Ahab. He runs into another prophet named Obadiah who, and sends, go tell your, go tell your message, your king, your your master Ahab that I'm here and I need to see him. And Obadiah says, uh-uh. I go tell him, and you the spirit may carry you off, who knows where. So maybe it was a thing, the spirit carrying um people off. Second Kings chapter two, verse 16, after Elijah is translated to heaven and Elisha comes back, Elijah and Elisha had crossed the Jordan River. Elijah struck it with his robe and the, and the Jordan River parted and they walked across. And the school of prophets, a whole bunch of people had seen this happen. Two of them went on to the other side of the river. Now one has come back. And they ask Elisha, where's your master? And, and should we go look for him? And he says, no, you don't need to. And they say, well, maybe the spirit took him and set him on a mountain someplace. We, we need to go look. Uh, that's 2 Kings 2, verse 16. But Philip finds himself in Azotus, and we're told that as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So he's heading up the coast, and he's going to come to the, the, the city of Lydda. He's going to come to the city of Joppa and some of the other cities on the way. 
he's proclaiming the gospel message until he reaches Caesarea, um, where he's going to stop and where he's going to settle. I find it interesting how God used Philip in this situation. Philip, who was, uh, if he was indeed a Hellenist Jew who had become a Christian, who he would be considered a second-class Jew by the Jews. And so he understands what it is to be a member of the exclusion, um, looked down on by the Jews. He is the ideal messenger to this Ethiopian eunuch because the eunuchs also are excluded from the assembly, regardless of how high ranking they are in the court of the queen of Ethiopia. And it's just, he just happens to be reading a very messianic passage and asking Philip questions about it. And Philip answers his questions and they just happen to come across water. This is God's hand all through it. Um, getting his message to the ends of the earth, fulfilling the prophecy, the, the commandment of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But that's not the only fulfillment of it. Ethiopia wasn't the only farthest reach of, of, the, of, the, of the earth. Uh, and if you read the traditional stories of the apostles, many of them go to very far reaches where they take the message of the gospel and the people they preach to carry it on even further until it's today here it is where i'm sitting here in albany some of you are sitting in texas uh gail is sitting in rome and we've all heard the gospel message in our various places that's where i'm going to stop uh i guess the class wasn't as short as i thought it would be surprise <laughs>